Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Stephen Nelson, Dean of the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts here at the National Gallery of Art. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's John Wilmer Ding Symposium on American Art, Afro-Atlantic Histories. Held in conjunction with the Afro-Atlantic Histories exhibition at the National Gallery of Art, the Wilmerding Symposium has gathered literary and visual artists to reflect on how art responds to and shapes both official and overlooked narratives wrought by the transatlantic slave trade and its legacies. The U.S. tour of this exhibition was curated by Kenitra Fletcher, Associate Curator of African American and Afro-Diasporic Art here at the Gallery, Molly Donovan, Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Gallery, and I, Molly and I served on the exhibition curatorial team. The symposium was made possible by a grant from the Alice L. Walton Foundation. Welcome to this first session named in honor of Professor Sadia Hartman's phrase, The Afterlife of Slavery, from her book, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Atlantic Slave Trade Route Terror, published in 2007. We regret that Professor Hartman is unable to join us this evening, but we celebrate her important scholarship nonetheless. I would also like to thank Ali Peel and Rachel Tanzi for their help with this evening's program. I'm really pleased that we have the artists Rosanna Paulino and Cameron Rowland joining us here for this session. And so as we go along, I will introduce them both, followed by Rosanna Paulino and followed by Cameron Rowland. Rosanna Paulino earned her BFA and PhD in Fine Arts at the School of Communications and Art History at Sao Paulo. Her work centers around social, ethnic, and gender issues, focusing on Black women in Brazilian society and various types of violence suffered by this population due to racism and the lasting legacy of slavery. Paulino explores the impact of memory on psychosocial constructions, introducing different references that intersect the artist's personal history with the phenomenological history of Brazil as it was constructed in the past and persists today. Her research includes the construction of myths, not only as aesthetical pillars, but also as psychic influence makers. Paulino, whose artistic output is unquestionably fundamental to Brazilian art, has produced a practice of reconstructing images and beyond that, reconstructing memory and its mythologies. Her body of work brings together female figures and their respective historical elements supported by psychic traces that map colonial structures and their impact onto the social and aesthetic fabric of our time. Paulino's work is represented in Afro-Atlantic histories by, the, by her work, per, per, Permanencia de Estructuras, or The Permanence of Structures, from 2017, a digital print on cut and sewn fabric. It is also a pleasure to welcome Cameron Rowland. Cameron Rowland earned their BFA in studio art from Wesleyan University. Roland is an artist making visible the institutions, systems, and policies that perpetuate systemic racism and economic inequality. Their research intensive work centers around the display of objects and documents whose provenance and operations expose the legacies of racial capitalism and underscore the forms of exploitation that permeate many aspects of our daily lives. They were named a MacArthur's Genius Fellow in 2019 and awarded a United States Artist Fellowship in 2020. Their work is represented in Afro-Atlantic histories by a piece called De Depreciation 2018, a restrictive covenant for a, quote, one acre piece of land at 8060 Maxi Road at Easto Island, South Carolina, that was part of the Maxi Place Plantation. It gives me great pleasure to turn the virtual lectern over to Rosano Paulino. Thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you, Stephen Nelson, for this warm presentation. Uh, the Afterlife of Slavery. And, uh, I would like to start to show this uh, work, Social Fabric, uh, that shows that this time, this afterlife of slavery looks never ends in Brazil. Uh, I mean, sometimes I think that we are still living in the slavery time because the Brazilian society is a so unequal um, society that it's difficult to sh really share uh, the past 
time and uh, the actual time, the, the time today, sorry, the time today. Uh, o Brasil has a lot of uh, inequality problems, uh, mainly regarding to black people. To understand this, to understand this society, I started to look at the past, to look at the slavery time, to look about the people that arrived in the country. And I start to deal with all the photos that uh, was easy to find at the internet or some postcards that uh, depicted the black people. And uh, to understand how the image, how, photo, uh, how photography, how science contribute to, um, to build this idea of blackness in the country. So you can see some uh, images from settlement, a partial view of this installation, where I discuss how uh, this kind of picture of a black female was used to um, animalize the black to the black people to take away the humanity of this group. It's an installation. Let me show you some images. Like here, for example, and the idea of trauma uh, that the Brazilians never put attention on uh, on this trauma caused by slavery in the country, and that it is impossible to understand the country. It's impossible to deal with the country without to deal with the the idea of trauma that is profoundly rooted in the Brazilian society. You can see here a uh, uh, detail. And I, I am very interested as well, uh, not only in photography, but also in the science and how science contributed to the ideas about black population. So I am studying um, and making works like this, Natural History. I will show you some pages of this artist book, like this, for example. When it, we can see the idea of flora or nature, the fauna, I mean, uh, nature, and the human beings as the same things to be exploited in the country. But uh, the exploited this year are, of course, the blacks and the uh, indigenous people. And I'm trying to deal with the idea of science that was used in the country to promote the idea of superiority of, the, um, of a group of people um, on the other. So the idea of science as a, a mechanism to try to make a group superior and how it was used together with the photography to, um, to reach this ideal. And uh, here we can see a work with some uh, ideas of tropical paradise that um, are present inside the Brazilian society as well. We have uh, photography, the same photographies that were took to promote the idea of superiority. At the same time, they had an uh, ambiguous um, role in the country because they promoted the idea of superiority, but at the same time, they promoted the, uh, the idea of the Brazil, of the country as a tropical paradise. But a tropical paradise for whom? Another with this idea of tropical paradise, we, uh, ever with this question tag, because tropical paradise for whom? And then this is the one that is in the exhibition, uh, Permanencia das Estruturas, the permanence of structures that show uh, this idea of exploitation on no? the time that survives in the Brazilian society. And then, you know, uh, we can see uh, uh, it's almost the same thing, but related here with the idea of nature and uh, tropical paradise, people, um, uh, animals, nature to be exploited ever and ever and ever. 
And um, here another about uh, the idea of exploitation. I use it a lot, this uh, idea of, um, I like to use it, uh, cloth in my in my works in this idea of a suture. This is not um, a sewing. Uh, this is like a, a suture. Uh, but Brazil is a country that never really put attention and illness caused by slavery. So we try as society to put things together and to make this so violent suture. Of course, this idea will not work. That's not possible to work. So I use this idea of suture to discuss this violence, the idea to put together using the force, the different groups um, in the country. And of course, black people um, will suffer with this because uh, we are not in the common uh, in this society. Um, I, in my work, I use uh, as well uh, the idea of how the visual arts uh, collaborated with the, this construction uh, about the country and how the ideas related to visual arts uh, that we have from Black people and we have uh, with um, from indigenous people never were considered when we think about visual arts in Brazil or we think about this like uh, something naive, something that uh, it's from uneducated people. So the visual environment in the country never considered really the legacy of these groups like, uh, like blacks and indigenous uh, as a uh, powerful way to deal with the uh, visual arts. So I am trying to discuss the modernism in Brazil, the idea that the, we, are, uh, we became a, a modern country using geometry, but it never considered uh, the, uh, the legacy of blacks, for example. Um, these ideas never considered the, the environment. So I try to discuss different topics like uh, violence, uh, like uh, art history, using uh, some ideas that are, some images that are prevenient from old photographies or from the documentation, the uh, expeditions uh, that traveled around the country and uh, uh, pictured the people, the nature, and, all, and these ideas are still present in the Brazilian society until today. So uh, this is another work from um, the same idea, Brazilian geometry, but now in, on canvas, because I want to make this larger, I am working now to uh, improve the idea of size. And so I started to, uh, to deal with canvas, uh, colleges directly on canvas. And uh, to finalize my presentation, uh, I think that um, we need, we artists, in, I mean, I, uh, I, as a black female artist, I am trying to discuss the country, I'm trying to discuss how it was made, I am trying to discuss how the country was built. But I have at the same time to deal with my ancestrality, uh, considering this ancestrality like a, a force, like a, something that we can't forget, we can deal, we can look at the past, but not just to look at the past, uh, like something that was, um, that caused the illness for us, that was difficult to deal, but looking at the back and trying to get um, strange to go ahead. So we can do this uh, working with our ancestrality. So I would like to show this still of the video called the Grand Mass, uh, as a voz in Portuguese. And I can find this very easy in the internet if you want to know more about this video. So we can see uh, the performer Charlene uh, uh, sewing the, these images of this grand mass in her body. 
uh, Charlene just uh, exists because these women, this grandmas, became before Charlene. And the grandmas, they, uh, it's like to come back to life because Charlene is bringing uh, her them and looking for their force, looking for their strength to carry on, to go to the future. So I would like to finish my presentation with these images of Das Avos or the Grand Mass. Thank you very much. And uh, I would like to welcome Cameron Holland for the next presentation. Thank you again, Stephen, for such generous introductions for both of us um, and uh, you know, for the invitation to, uh, to participate in this. I'm so glad to be here and um, you know, uh, very honored to be participating in the exhibition. Um, and the, the premise for this panel is, um, you know, I mean, I think it very obviously uh, resonates with, you know, Rosanna's work in so many different ways. And it's, uh, I think, similar for me. It's, it's, um, it's really important. Uh, this idea of Hartman's work in general and, and her sort of concept of the afterlife of slavery uh, really kind of integral to what I'm working on uh, throughout my work. Um, this presentation is, is primarily about uh, depreciation, the, the piece that's included in the exhibition, um, and trying to give it a little bit of socio-historical context, uh, much of which is you know, in, informed by CDS work. So I guess I just wanted to start um, you know, by mentioning that the concept of the afterlife of slavery has been articulated throughout Hartman's oeuvre uh, in the Dead Book Revisited, um, she describes it as being defined by, quote, the enduring and seemingly interminable clutch of the hold on our present and by the ongoing processes of dispossession, accumulation, and extermination. The concept of the afterlife of slavery is closely bound to her theorization of the non-event of emancipation, which is central to her first book, Scenes of Subjection. The book, which seeks to interrogate progressivist narratives of freedom has informed much of my work, as I mentioned, and um, the introduction to scenes outlines some of the contradictions created by prevailing histories of slavery. Hartman writes, if periodization is a barrier imposed from above that obscures the involuntary servitude and legal subjection that followed in the wake of slavery, then attempts to assert absolutist distinctions between slavery and freedom are untenable. Fundamentally, such assertions involve distinctions between the transient and the apocal, underestimate the contradictory inheritance of emancipation in the forms of involuntary servitude that followed in the wake of slavery and diminish the reign of terror that accompanied the advent of freedom. Put differently, does the momentousness of emancipation as an event ultimately efface the continuities between slavery and freedom and the dispossession inseparable from becoming a, a quote, property person? The centrality of emancipation in our political imaginary is part of what makes the afterlife of slavery such a critical intervention. How can we understand what comes after emancipation differently if we are to regard it as a non-event that did not offer the arrival of freedom, nor the completion of slavery in either law or practice? Um, I have this kind of ongoing study of reparations and and in that study, the, the non-event of emancipation plays a significant role. Um, as Stephen mentioned, my work included in the exhibition is titled Depreciation and directly references the entanglement of emancipation with what is typically referred to as the origin of reparations claims. At the outset of the Civil War, the North had no intention of abolishing slavery. As W.E.B. Du Bois writes in Black Reconstruction in America, quote, the North was not abolitionist. 
It was overwhelmingly in favor of Negro slavery so long as this did not interfere with Northern moneymaking. Lincoln wrote in 1862, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would also do that. Emancipation then can be understood as a military strategy. Uh, recognizing the limited possibilities for Union victory in 1862, Lincoln sought to use the 1863 Emancipation Proclamation to draw the enslaved across the battle lines. This would simultaneously deprive the Confederacy of food and labor and would provide this labor source to the Union Army. The Emancipation Proclamation states that, quote, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people will, whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. As such, the proclamation did not apply to the four Union states that allowed slavery, nor was it legally recognized within the Confederacy. It functioned as intended according to Du Bois, quote, to make easier the replacement of unwilling Northern white soldiers with black soldiers. Incentivizing tens of thousands of enslaved people to defect from their masters and fight for the union. Du Bois continues, black men were repeatedly used as shock troops where there was little or no hope of success. Black soldiers accounted for approximately 10% of the union army and 20% of their dead. At the end of the war, black people who were formerly enslaved and many who were born free were still not citizens. The 13th Amendment passed in 1865 was intended to abolish slavery but did not grant black citizenship. The 14th Amendment passed in 1866 was intended to grant black citizenship but did not confer black voting rights. The 15th Amendment passed in 1869 was intended to grant black voting rights which had been withheld from free black people in the North as well as the South, but only applied to men and has been flouted by racist voting restrictions to this day. And one of the reasons I'm committed to the term reparations as a conceptual container for the ground of black material contestation is that it has been rejected for nearly 150 years as a black radical fantasy. Part of the political debate around reparations has been over what form it should take, assuming both its singularity and its conclusivity. This debate also assumes that reparations is a future possibility rather than an ongoing practice. The long tradition of making reparations pursuits is formally identified in the work of Callie House, Queen Mother Audley Moore, Sister Jonita Scott Opadelli, and Deidre Farmer Paleman. Reparations is part of a black feminist practice that contains many shared and divergent positions. And regarding all these positions as constitutive of reparations, reparations as a discourse and an arena of practice might be defined by its multiplicity of genealogies. In trying to trace the origins of reparations claims, I've looked to the ex-slavery settlement dictated by General Sherman's Field Order 15 from 1865. Like many, I had understood that 40 acres and a mule had been promised to ex-slaves following the end of the Civil War, but was never granted. In fact, during 1865, approximately 40,000 ex-slaves were resettled on the basis of possessory title with up to 40 acres per family, only to have these lands taken away by the Andrew Johnson administration in 1866. This is an approximate map of what became known as Sherman's Reservation the primary area set aside for ex-slavery settlement in 1865. One of the only records of the ex-slavery settlement takes the form of the registers of land and occupants, which were created in 1866 to document the repossession of the lands by the former Confederate owners. From left to right, the columns of the register read date, name of owner referring to the plantation owner, name of plantation, locality, number of acres, and then number of freed people living there, followed by demographic details of the freed population, if applicable. Despite the legal revocation of the lands, numerous acts of resistance were mounted through various methods, 
many of which appeared minor, but were effective enough to result in official complaints by the planters. Resistance to the stability of property and ownership was not unusual at this time in the coastal region of South Carolina. Letters detailing former planters' former planters' complaints to government agencies indicate the extent of their impact and the collective capacity of former slaves' refusal to work or contract, to be bound to stay or to be ordered to leave. I find this resistance to the regime of property remarkable. More than the granting of the land, it stands out to me because it does not comply with the contingent forms of allowance that first compelled the white control government to grant the land for fear of uprising and then caused this government to rescind it. This fear of uprising was longstanding in South Carolina where for much of the 18th century and much of the 19th century, the slave population was far greater than the white population. The low country of South Carolina in particular had been grounded in a tradition of black resistance. In consideration of this tradition, I have been thinking about how reparations manifest as the relinquishment of value rather than the redistribution of it. The work I made in line with this tradition is titled Depreciation. It consists of one acre of land on Edisto Island, South Carolina, and a restrictive covenant. Um, my works always use a descriptive caption, which includes information that I consider a material component of the work. The full caption for this piece um, reads, 40 acres and a mule as reparations for slavery originates in General William Tecumseh Sherman's Special Fuel Orders Number 15, issued on January 16, 1865. Sherman's Field Order 15 was issued out of concern for a potential uprising of the thousands of ex-slaves who were following his army by the time it arrived in Savannah. The Field Order stipulated that, quote, the islands from Charleston South the abandoned rice fields along the rivers for 30 miles back from the sea, and the country bordering the St. John's River in Florida are reserved and set apart for the settlement of the Negroes now made free by the acts of war and the proclamation of the President of the United States. Each family shall have a plot of not more than 40 acres of tillable ground. This was followed by the formation of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands in March 1865. In the months immediately following the issue of the field orders, approximately 40,000 former slaves settled in the area designated by Sherman on the basis of possessory title. 10,000 of these former slaves were settled on Edisto Island, South Carolina. In 1866, following Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson effectively rescinded Field Order 15 by ordering these lands be returned to their previous Confederate owners. Former slaves were given the option to work for their masters as sharecroppers or be evicted. If evicted former slaves could be arrested for homelessness under vagrancy clauses of the Black Codes. Those who refused to leave and refused to sign sharecrop contracts were threatened with arrest. Although restoration of the land to the previous Confederate owners was slowed in some cases by court challenges filed by ex-slaves, nearly all the land settled was returned by the 1870s. As Eric Foner writes, Johnson had in effect abrogated the Confiscation Act and unilaterally amended the law creating the Freedmen's Bureau. The idea of a Freedmen's Bureau actively promoting black land ownership had come to an abrupt end. The Freedmen's Bureau agents became primary proponents of labor contracts, inducting former slaves into the sharecropping system. Among the lands that were repossessed in 1866 by former Confederate owners was the Maxie Place Plantation. A group of freed people were at Maxie Place in January 1866. The people contracted to work for the proprietor but no contract or list of names has been found. The one acre piece of land at 8060 Maxie Road, Edisto Island, South Carolina, 
was part of the Maxi Place plantation. This land was purchased at market value on August 6, 2018 by 8060 Maxi Road, Inc., a nonprofit company formed for the sole purpose of buying this land and recording a restrictive covenant on its use. This covenant has as its explicit purpose the restriction of all development and use of the property by the owner. The property is now appraised at zero dollars. By rendering it legally unusable, this restrictive covenant eliminates the market value of the land. These restrictions run with the land regardless of the future owner. As such, they will last indefinitely. As reparation, this covenant asks how land might exist outside of the legal economic regime of property that was instituted by slavery and colonization. Rather than redistributing the property, the restriction imposed on 8060 Maxi Road status as valuable and transactable real estate asserts the antagonism to the regime of property as a means of reparation. This is what I call the component of the work intended for exhibition. The left frame contains the deed and the restrictions. This is the deed. And this is the first page of the restrictions. It's the definitions of terms used within the contract. These are the restrictions themselves. This is the appraisal that was conducted after the restrictions were recorded. It's the narrative of the appraisal. The appraiser concludes the reconciliation section writing, I estimate the market value as defined of subject property as of August 25th, 2018 to be $0. These are the images taken by the appraiser, which are a standard component of all appraisals. Uh -huh. And these are the maps that are also part of standard part of appraisals. This is a, in context of the entire island. And this is a historical map uh, of Edisto plantations in 1850. Um, you can see in the middle, uh, these are the boundaries of what was Maxi Place Plantation. As a tradition, black antagonism of property operates through intergenerational continuance. In contrast to market-based notions of liberation, what Hartman calls the burdened individuality of freedom, the tradition of Black antagonism is implicitly collective. While not always comprised of group activity, its participatory logic renders it external to the type of freedom characterized by liberal individualism. It is a collectivity outlined by a negative relationship to accumulation. The limits imposed on accumulation are neither successful or failed rebellions, but are part of the perpetual contestation of property and propertization. In this way, black antagonist practices of reparations have been occurring for centuries, long before and after 1865. These practices corrosive relationship to value and domination is not the reason for their existence. It is however central to how they exist within the conditions of our reality. As a mode of reparations, this antagonism is inherently incomplete and necessarily ongoing. It is a reparations that continually confronts the end of white supremacist subjection without anticipating this end. So I want to thank you both for your, your incredibly rich and, and, and provocative presentations and for giving us a window into, into the work and how you think about it. And there are so many things that you two share in common. And you know, not, not the least being the topic of this of this panel.
and thinking about and thinking about the legacy of of slavery. And and, and Rosanna, you said you said we are still living in slavery time, right? And and Cameron, with the ways in which you think about that land, um, and the sort of bestowing and taking back of the land, um, both of these you know, sort of retell retell histories, refashion, intervene. And I would love to hear you both talk a little more about, about how, you know, what, what that power is for you in, in the works that you're doing. Well, uh, yeah, Brazil spent a lot of time thinking that we were a kind of democ uh, racial democracy, and that is not true. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I think that we still um, have some images in the country uh, that uh, I like in the slavery time. Mm -hmm. I went to the Rio de Janeiro this weekend and I saw some images that uh, were exactly like um, some painters that represented the, the slavery times uh, did. They were the same. They were the same. And I think that we have to start really to discuss the mm -hmm. legacy of slavery in the country and not believe more in this uh, kind of uh, idea of democ uh, racial democracy. I believe that we can do this using arts. It's a very powerful um, tool to deal with this question. Uh, I have a lot of requests to have my work um, in books for children, books for uh, school children, uh, school children. It's very important. It's very important. For me, it's the way, uh, it's a good, very good way to start to discuss this subject. And mm -hmm. also, um, image has a lot of power. Uh, image is something really powerful. But in Brazil, we never put, we never really put attention and the power of the images. Mm -hmm. So when we have an exhibition um, that can show which, uh, for example, it's very interesting to see how people go to the exhibition. They wanted to see themselves there. They wanted to discuss it. It makes the social uh, movements really stronger, really stronger. So it's very, um, uh, uh, it's very good to see young people going to the exhibitions, uh, for example, and discussing this. It's, yes. it's something new in the country. It's really something new in the country. My mm -hmm. generation, for example, never, never put attention on this. Uh, I did not see myself represented in the book, is in the scholar books. I never see, I, sorry, I never saw, sometimes in my language, sorry. I never saw myself represented as a human being. So to put this is something that I believe that um, it's very important. It's mm -hmm. really fundamental to put on the table this kind of a discussion in my country. And I do believe that fine arts, visual arts has a, a very important role uh, in this kind of a discussion in Brazil. And Cameron, what do you think? I really appreciate, you know, that, that answer, Rosanna. And, and I, I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot about, particularly in, in my sort of ongoing reparations project is, are these, uh, sort of contradictory constructions of time, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, linear progressivist narratives uh, say that the past is past, and, um, and the, but, the, but the, you know, sort of uh, the, the temporality of capitalist accumulation actually requires that the past is continually compounded materially to mm -hmm. expand and grow, right? And so when we think about you know, the, the, the profits of slavery and the ways in which they've, you know, sort of uh, you know, grown exponentially, um, how is it that we can hold that being sort of a, a, a rational governing logic of our contemporary reality, right? And the, and the consolidation and distribution and means of reproduction of value uh, with this idea that 
the past is bygone and has nothing to do mm-hmm. with the rest of our social reality. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think that it's a, a very convenient um, narrative for exactly what, you know, Razan was, was describing these, these uh, you know, I think um, con- these conceptions of, of mm-hmm. our, uh, you know, social fabric, as, as, as you mentioned in your work and, and, um, you know, and our, uh, political life, um, that don't, uh, account for so many aspects of, uh, you know, what it is that not only, um, came before, but continues to impact our everyday lives, right? And so, you know, I think the, one of the things that I'm, you know, that was, the, that was the, the sort of impetus for this piece was to say, oh, you know, I mean, like in the United States, you know, we, we've all heard of 40 acres and a mule. Right. How often do we know or engage with the fact that this was not, you know, something that was uh, a theory or a hypothesis, but was, was actually a material reality and was one of one of yet many other things that was taken away, right? And so right. The, 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 um, the narratives around, you know, our uh, political imaginary and right. um, our concept of social possibility are so constrained mm-hmm. by uh, the ways in which, you know, s- certain things are reproduced, right? You know, the lionization of Lincoln, for instance, and certain things are not. For instance, his, you know, indifference really about uh, abolition as, you know, Mm -hmm. war went on um, and how that shifted, obviously, in an opportunistic way, which, you know, again, something that is not, you know, a a radical revising of history. This is in Black Reconstruction, right? This is, you know, a a seminal historical text um, of the United States. Uh, And so I think that as you know, Rosanna is saying, like one of the things that's meaningful about art is that we are able to, you know, put it in in proximity um, to, you know, uh, an audience that's, you know, uh, could 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 potentially be anyone. And I think the the mm-hmm. beauty of this exhibition being at the National Gallery is not not only that, you know, <laughs> it is a way of um, actually acknowledging the, the, the existence and significance of, you know, uh, some of the histories that the various artists and works are reflecting on, but it's also not constraining the understanding of the history of slavery to the United States, which I think globally is a, deeply problematic. Right? This is a, you know, a, an institutional system that has deep implications throughout the entire world. Mm-hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that, you know, f- for all of its problematics, the system of art actually has is the capacity to bring some of those different positions together. Um, and, and so anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, to do that tonight. That's it. I, I love what you both said, because what you also, what you also infer through your work is that, you know, is that these histories keep coming back. <laughs> you know, we, we might, you know, you know, economically, juridically, but also psychologically and emotionally. Absolutely. Right? And so we feel this when, you know, Cameron, when you talk about the land, you know, we feel that viscerally, even through reading, reading the, the documents and the things that make up your piece. And, and, and if you're in the gallery and people are looking at your piece, they are reading every word, which is amazing. And, and Rosanna, it's, it's the same with your work, where people are understanding the images and the, the reproduction of the, the slave ship Brooks that you have at the center of that piece. And those icons, people know those icons and they feel them. And, and it's, not, it's not exactly the past repeating itself, but it is, it is the past being reenacted in some way. And it seems to me what you're both trying to do is short circuit that, you know, short, short circuit how we think it's supposed to work. 
And I don't know if I'm getting that right, if I'm wrong, or, you know, and even thinking about Sadia Hartman in all of this, you know, there, there is the, you know, she, she talks in these works about the interior life, right? And that in many ways in Lose Your Mother and in um, Spaces of Subjection, what she's trying to get back is this notion of having the actual ability to tell that thing, to sort of, to sort of recuperate it, if you will, or imagine it. And I, and, I, and I wonder how or if the two of you have thought in those terms about the kinds of work that you do. Or to make it more specific, Rosanna, when you, when you were showing the geometry and these pictures in there, and this is sort of mashup. And, you, and at one point you mentioned the violence of art history. And I thought, you know, is there is there something that you're that you're wondering about or exploring, you know, in the in the intersection of these sutured pieces and these bodies and these guns with what we would think of as geometric abstraction in Brazilian art at a certain point in the 20th century. Yes, um, I think that the, expo the idea of not consider black people mm -hmm. as part of population um, is inside both the ideas. When I make the sutures, for example, that's a very mm -hmm. violent process. Um, and when I deal with the idea of Brazilian geometry, if the sutures is something that uh, I think is more linked with the, the body, uh, with the body, mm -hmm. for example, the pain that it brings. I think that mm -hmm. uh, the, the the idea of geometry is equally violent because uh, it is de it deals with uh, the idea that the black people is not capable to think the country to produce something that is really part of the country. So mm -hmm. the idea uh, Brazil. Uh, is no uh, no in the world as a country that has a kind of um, uh, facility uh, not facility uh, it's easy for us uh, to deal with geometry. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of vocation. It's a kind mm -hmm. of vocation. But this idea of geometry was important uh, from Europe. The, these are artists that deal with the geometry. They did not look at the geometry that was produced, uh, that it was ever produced by black people or by indigenous people. So what mm. kind of vocation this one that put aside, um, that not consider the great majority of the population. Mm. It's a process so violently for me, like the idea of not consider um, the, like the human, uh, black people like human, being human. So we have to check as well uh, this process related with the uh, intellectuality, with the capacity of producing knowledge. Right. So for me, it produces mm -hmm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Knowledge? Yeah, well, uh, So for me, it's important to look at all the process. Uh, the process related to the science, to the way that the black population was depicted, but it is uh, it is uh, important to look at the process of knowledge uh, to produce knowledge, and uh, this uh, idea that black people is not capable to do right. this kind of uh, this thing. Right, and also I think what you point out is that knowledge is not objective. Yeah, it's not objective, right? And so you have all of those, those the skulls and the bodies that are put up for display in order, as you so brilliantly said, to show basically what you know that white people are superior, right? Um, that black people are, are inferior, and so that you you have the beautiful intersection of of you know the production of knowledge, but the you know, sort of looking through it and looking under the hood and and seeing what its what its political goals are. Yes, yes, that's very political. I can't see this um, charity. For me, they are all the time, like, you know, uh, interpreting uh, uh, one each the other. Mm -hmm. There's different fields of knowledge. Yes, yes. They are not in boxes. Right. 
So they are all the time, you know, like this. Mm -hmm. Crossing one Absolutely. Yeah, other. yeah. Cameron, we have people obsessed with your work in the chat. And people want to know if the land is actually accessible. There's that. Um, they want to know, um, well, you can read it yourself. And we, you know, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, Ian Ware asks, in terms of covenant restrictions, is your work accessible? As in, can the owner even visit the land? And what does that say about the relationship between institution and art object if the piece were eventually acquired by a museum? Uh, yeah, that's a good Could question. it be, or if the museum gets it, can it actually do anything with it? I mean, the, the, you know, one of the things that I'm sort of interested in, I guess, is the you know, possibility for um, an artwork to have a kind of multiplicity of its own, right? And so for me, this work, um, there's this component intended for exhibition that circulates within this sort of uh, system of, of exhibition making within the art world. Um, then uh, the restrictions exist within the um, county assessor's office in Charleston. Um, and the title is also, you know, uh, registered at the county level. Um, the property obviously uh, exists, you know, um, at its address. Uh, together, you know, all of these things um, you know, comprise the work. Uh, I don't think of any, any one of them as, uh, you know, more important or, or less part of the art than another. Um, visiting the land, I mean, you know, as you can see in the pictures, there's Maxi Road, uh, the road that it's on, that you can drive by and look at it. Um, it, part of the uh, you know premise for the work uh, in, in a number of different ways is that it's unimproved, so that it's just overgrown. Um, you know, legally speaking, um, it's not really supposed to be used. Uh, use has a number of definitions in the restrictive covenant. Um, uh, you know, can can you you know? Uh, it's not like there's a an alarm or something that would be triggered if you walk on it. <laughs> um, the my the way that I try to talk with people about this is that you know it's not like a piece of land art that you go on a pilgrimage to visit. Um, the this piece of property is you know existing sort of on its own terms, and it's right. in some ways uh, ho holding out for a time where the you know, legal economic regime that constructs land as inherently valuable, transactable, mm -hmm. and accumulative um, you know, might, might no longer exist. And it, and it mm -hmm. asks in that, in that potential scenario, what does our relationship to land look like? What, if, if we're not thinking about it purely in terms of use, if we're not thinking about it purely in terms of exchange, you know, what is the, the um, the, the you know relationship that that we have uh, to something called land that's not property, um, and in that way, uh, you know, I'm I'm you know sort of trying not to uh, you know sort of reproduce a, a, another type of utility in it, but just have it exist uh, you know kind of on its own terms. That is incredibly interesting. And, and, and in a way, it, it sort of takes aim at the art industrial complex as well. Thinking about that. If we think about it. Um, let me see, we are, we are actually running a bit short on time here. I want to be respectful of people's time. But I do, before we go, um, I do want to... Um, sort of think a little bit about research, you know, and the role of research in your work, because the two of you are visual artists who, who do incredible research, like do really, really deep research. And I would love, I would love for the two of you to sort of share with our, our audience a bit about how that has, how that inflects your practice, how it, you know, where it lives in your practices. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, you wish was there, as you wish. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an academic, what can I tell you? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, oh, I, I talked yeah, for 25 years. I'm really interested one. to hear, hear yeah. what you have to say. I mean, I, I, um, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of, I feel like, you know, uh, just really interested in, I mean, I think about research as a way of being with other people. So I feel like this is like a, a really nice convening because it's a, it's just a way of, of being with other people's, um, you know, thoughts, because I don't, I'm not thinking about that as, you know, like I said, you know, I'm trying to think about this as a, as, as participation in something that's ongoing rather than, you know, making a kind of modernist intervention of, of, that came out of nowhere. But I, I, and I feel, I feel that's, you know, at play in, in your practice as well. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, and in my case, um, I use the art to try to understand uh, who I am, the place of uh, I occupy in the world and uh, my group, um, how uh, we occupy a place, we occupy a place in the Brazilian uh, society. And uh, it was not possible to see this, um, to try to understand it, um, just looking at visual artists. So I realized that it was impossible to deal with arts without uh, going, for example, to study to uh, study uh, science, for example, to study history. So it was very funny because when I, I got my PhD, you had a lot of books about the history of science, a lot of books about uh, um, history, about sociology, but uh, not really uh, about art in Brazil because this kind of stuff was not a really um, a subject uh, in Brazilian art. So uh, the research for me, uh, it's a way to uh, try to understand uh, why we occupy uh, this uh, place in the Brazilian society and how um, uh, it was made by others. So it was not, uh, I, I would not find this in the visual artists. So I, I really have to do this kind of research like, like, for example, mm -hmm. a person that um, deals with the history of science uh, to understand um, how the Brazil is today and why the, the country is like it is today. Right. Well, I think that on that note, um, I want to thank both of you, Rosanna and Cameron, for being with us this evening and for for sharing your thoughts, your work, and making time for us. Um, we learned a lot, and I I, I'm really grateful. And I want to thank our audience for joining us, and I hope everyone has a great evening. <laughs>